good evening and thank you for coming. Let's begin our talk with the third factor of blessing. Altogether there are 38 factors of blessing. Now we are on the third one. So it's a long way to go. The third factor of blessing is Pooja Japujaniyana. Pujaniyana. People who are worthy of your respect, veneration. Pooja Venerating them. Venerating those who are worthy of your veneration. Now, as I have very clearly explained to you, this is the beginning or the initial introductory blessings, foundational blessings that we are going on. To whom these foundational blessings are relevant? <clears throat> to the children who are growing up physically as well as mentally. First one is not to associate the wrong kind, then to associate the right people. The third one is to respect those who are worthy of respect. Now let's begin about this with the birth of the Buddha himself. When the Buddha was born, we, we call him the Bodhisattva. The legend is, now you don't or you shouldn't question about this stuff, these are legends, that he took seven steps just after his birth to the north and at the seventh step he stood, raised his right hand and he uttered a stanza which says Agohamasmi lokasa Jeto hamasmi lokasa Seto hamasmi lokasa Ayamanti majati Nati dani punabhavo Abho jeto Seto Hamasmi Lokas. I am the greatest, the eldest, the noblest in this world. Now, out of these three, my concern is when this just born infant says, I am the eldest in the world. Now this sentence explains much. A just born child, he says, I am the eldest. It is very clear he is not at all old enough in the physical age wise. Physically, he is just born. But he is not talking at all about the physical age. He is talking about the spiritual age. It says, in his last life, the Bodhisattva, even before his enlightenment, he is not to respect, not to bow down, not to venerate anyone, but all to respect him 
all together with him is worthy of receiving respect from everybody. He has already cultivated his spirituality more than any human being at that time existing in that world. That's why he is worthy of being respected from everyone. Hence he says, Jetto Humas I am the eldest in the world. Now in Buddhism, chronological or physical age is not valued. Valued only the spiritual age. It doesn't mean that we don't respect the elderly people, but on this spiritual journey, though someone gets old physically, it happens naturally, whether you study or not, whether you live this life in a worthy manner or not, doesn't matter, you get old. A criminal get old, a saint get old, a foolish person will be old, an intelligent person will be old. Physically everybody gets old. But what matters is how much you get old spiritually. Very rarely it happens. Very rarely this spiritual age happens to people. It has entered into Buddhism so much that it says even somebody becomes a monk at the age of 60, if we ask the rope at the age of 60 today and he meets a monk who is 20, 25 years old like his grandchild, grandson, but still that 60 year old monk has to respect that 21 year old monk who became monk yesterday or before that. What matters is how much you have been practicing after you became a monastic. Now when monks meet each other, Usually, when we meet somebody unknown to us, there is one question we ask as the first one. How much vasa you have? Vasa means how much brain's retreat have you spent so far? With the figures of those brain's retreat, we can calculate how long he has been a monk, especially a fully ordained monk. How long has he been in this robe? We can calculate. According to that, we declare I am older than you or I am younger than you. Not physical age. So you may find sometimes elderly looking monk is paying respect to a younger looking young monk. Yeah. This is how Buddhism has embedded this idea of spiritual age into it. So there is offering, there is respect for the elders in the sense of spiritually developed elders. Now there are several types of elders mentioned in Buddhism. First one is Jati Tero. I think you may have heard about this word Tero. When a monk, especially a monk, 
higher ordinated monk. I think after 10 years of his higher ordination, he can use this term Tero. Tero is translated, it means elderly person, old man, nothing special. That's so, all. He himself declared, I am old. <laughs> so, Jati Tero, if somebody gets old by birth, that is the first elderly person by birth. Second one is Dhamma Tero. Ah, this is the spiritually aged person. He is aged in Dhamma. He has been practicing. He is an old timer in the Dhamma. The third one is Sammuti Tero. By, by the acceptance of the society. He is old. By the social acceptance, by the conventions, he is old. So there are triple types of old age explained in Buddhism, maybe relevant to that era. First one is even today, old by birth. Second, old by the Dhamma. The third is old by conventions. Sammuti Tero, Jati Tero, Dhamma Tero, Sammuti Tero. Now all these situations, Buddha says what? It is worthy of respect. Even somebody gets old by birth, even though he is just physically old, he is worthy of your respect. Now, does Buddha need our respect? Does the Sangha need our respect? Or does the Buddha's valuation happen because we respect him? If our respect decides or evaluate the value of the Buddha, the virtues, the qualities of the Buddha, he is not really a Buddha. Buddha's status will not go up or go down just because we respect or not respect him. Our respect doesn't matter for the Buddha. To whom it matters? It matters to us. Because in the first place, if you don't respect, it means you don't accept. Accept what? Accept the guidance given by the Buddha. You cannot say wholeheartedly, I don't have any other refuge other than the Buddha. You cannot declare this wholehearted explanation that the Buddha is the only master for me because you don't pay the necessary respect to say that. Respect is useful for a growing child to accept the guidelines given by parents, given by teachers, given by Jati Tero, Dhamma Tero, Sammuti Tero. These elders who are elders of birth, elders by Dhamma, elders by convention. If you are to accept their guidelines, number one is to happen, you respect them. You give up respects, throw away that respects, it means you are not ready to accept. That means you are so adamant, your life is in danger. Remember, even the Buddha wanted a teacher 
who is the teacher of the Buddha? Yeah? Exactly. When he was enlightened, it is a self-enlightened. He found this technique called Vipassana and he found the technique to get rid of all the defilements, to become ultra pure, to get rid of this bondage into the sansara, bondage into the cycle of birth and death. Then he found, I came to this status, enlightenment alone. No personal, no individual that I have to pay respect, to say this is my teacher. Then he thought, nobody must be there without a teacher. The teacher is the one to guide. The teacher is the one to protect. Even I need a teacher for my guidance in the sharing of this Dhamma with the world. There will be difficult points, there will be hazards, hazardous moments, there will be troubles, there will be problems on my way then I must need a teacher to guide me through those difficult times. I will put this Dhamma that I realized. Nothing else will guide me other than this Dhamma. I will put this Dhamma as my, in the position of my teacher. So if even the Buddha understood the importance of a teacher about us. Until we die, we need somebody in that particular position to pay respect and seek the guidance for our fortune. There is already one, the Buddha. Though Buddha is not physically existing anymore, but remember, Dhamma is very much alive. Your Dhamma Pasati so Pasati. Buddha says, if you see the Dhamma, you see the Buddha. You can see the Buddha through the Dhamma. So the Buddha is very much alive through the Dhamma. We can seek the guidance from this Dhamma for our life to move on without dangers, without disasters, without going down to the perdition. We can have a smooth sail, not only in this life, but throughout the samsara with the guidance of the Buddha. But to accept to those guidance, we have to maintain, cultivate such a respect, veneration towards the Buddha. Now there are two types of venerations. First one called Amisa Puja, veneration through materials, the offerings of flowers, incense, herbal rings, food, clothing, all material offerings. They are called Amisa Puja. Respect, veneration through materials. Useful. Useful for the benefits of the cycle. Benefits of the life to life. Moving on this cycle. They are secular benefits. Amisa Puja will not grant you to get out of the cycle. But to have a pleasant existence in this cycle, Amisa Puja is important. But of course, I have witnessed some people come for Amisa Puja, they come for blessings, they come for chantings, they come for offerings. After some time, they get into what? 
they get into Parikpati Puja. Veneration through practice, veneration through principles. They come to meditation, they start learning deeper Dhamma, they come to the Patipati. So it is a gradual progress from Amisa Puja to Patipati Puja from the of respect through materials to the respect of principles, respect of practice. Now, out of these two offerings, offerings through materials, offerings through principles, practice, what did the Buddha value most? Buddha valued the practice. That's a beautiful incident just before Buddha's passing away. When the monks heard, since Buddha declared that henceforth, within three months, my passing away will happen. He foresaw the death and he declared it. I will last only for three months. Those unenlightened monks, they gathered, they started lamenting, weeping, we are going to be teacherless, we are going to be guideless, we are going to be deserted. What I am going to do? They were talking, lamenting, weeping. Among them there was one particular monk. This monk, he did not join all those lamentations, talkings. He started practicing. He doubled his effort on meditation. Then those weeping monks thought, now this is not a person who has the faith on the Buddha. He doesn't have respect to the Buddha. That is why he doesn't shed tears. He doesn't cry. They even reported the Buddha about this person. You see, you have a monk who doesn't have respect about you, who doesn't have veneration towards you. He's not a good monk. Monk, the Buddha summoned that monk and asked him, these people complain about you that you are not weeping about me, about my passing away. What's going on? Then this monk said, Bhagavan, I know you are going to pass away within three months. I determined myself before you are passing away, somehow I will fulfill my goal. Somehow I will become an arahant. Somehow I will get enlightened before you are passing away. That is why I started practicing. Buddha said, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Very rarely Buddha appreciate saying Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. He said Sadhu three times for this month. And his Buddha said, this is my disciple. This is the person I wanted. He is offering me in the best way that anybody can offer me. He is practicing as I said. He is not wasting his time. He is being very vigilant. This is the best offering for me. This is what the Buddha wanted, Patipati Puja, offering through practice, offering through principles. If you turn his guidance, if you convert his principles, Buddha's principles, to your principles, that is the best offering for him. Patipati Puja. 
So there are two types of offerings. We cannot look down upon. Dham is a puja offering through materials. It is very important, very helpful for the continuance of this dispensation for the Buddhism. Our ancient ancestors They have been practicing Mahamisa Puja continuously, offering to the Buddha, offering to the Sasana. That's why Buddhism continued so far, even after 2600 years. The Buddhism exists in its pristine quality due to the practice of Mahamisa Puja of our ancestors. If nobody provided the materials to exist, Buddhism would have vanished. So Amisa Puja is very important, but the most important thing is that you convert yourselves in the sense that you bring these principles into your heart and make them your principles. That is the best of offering to the Buddha. Now for a meditator, when you go to a master, you have to maintain such an attitude. When you found a good master, you have to go to him being an empty cup. I think you may have heard about the same story, that full cup, empty cup. If you go to a master, being a person that he is all, that who is already full, the master cannot help you at all. Today people go to the masters and they maintain these attitudes. Master knows, I also know. Yeah. Then how can the master guide you? But if you go to a real master, you should go to him. Master knows. I know not. Then the master can guide you. Then you can pay the full respect, veneration to the master. And the master will lead you. That's why every meditation master, they ask you to leave aside your former practices and come to this as somebody who knows nothing. As an empty cup, you come to him. Then he can guide you with his own practice. If you also think that I also know, it means you are not surrendering to the master completely. Yeah. Your surrender will not happen completely if you think, I also know. So the full respect, surrender to the teacher to guide you is the third mangala, third auspicious factor for a child, growing up child, to practice, to develop. This is the third one. Then the next one, if you can find the chanting, the, the sutta, the next stanza is Patirupa Pesava Socha Upecha Kata Punyata Atta Samma Anidicha Etam Mangala Mutitamam. Pati Rupa Desava Socha. I think it is better we recite once more together. Yeah. Pati Rupa Desava Socha. Upecha Kata Punyata. At Samma Pani Dicha Etam Mangala Muttamam. Now the fourth blessing is 
to live in a suitable location to have a suitable location now this is something we cannot decide right we are born into it if you have the merits you will move out if the place is not suitable to you because if the environment we are living is that disturbing that troublesome <coughs> That environment is suitable only for the bad karma to come to surface. Only for the bad, unwholesome accumulations of the karma to surface, that environment is suitable. If you are living in a soothing, less and less criminal activities, better and better types of people living in your environment if your environment is not supporting for the bad to happen then also your wholesome karmic accumulations come onto the surface remember karma needs assistance assistance from whom from yourself as well as your environment so if you are in a bad environment, in an unwholesome environment, unwholesome accumulations of your karma started surfacing. Those unwholesome accumulations will not have the opportunity to come onto the surface if you are living in such a beautiful, soothing environment. Yeah? That's why once you have the power, you have the karmic potentials to move out of that place, it is better to get out for a better environment. Now, the legend is that when the Bodhisattva, prior to his last birth, the Bodhisattva was in the Tusitta heaven, waiting for his last birth. And he was called Sant Tusitta, one of the divine kings. He has the longevity or he has enough lifetime ahead. But it says, the divine beings from the six Deva realms, there are six divine realms in Buddhism, those divine beings gathered up and they went to meet this Santu Sita, king of the gods, and invited this king. There is a stanza about this invitation. Kalo yante mahavira upajamatu kuchya sadevakam tarayanto bujasu amatam padam. They made this invitation that this is the time, O oh Great One, for you to be born in a human womb because only as a human being that somebody can become a Buddha. So they made this invitation. After the invitation it says that the Bodhisattva, this divine Santusita, king of the gods, he observed five factors. Kalam Deepam Chadesancha he observed Kala, the times, right time. What is the right time? The right time is 
that the human longevity or human life span, lifetime shouldn't be lower than 120 or more than 80,000 years old. Yes. Yeah. These are legendary things. Okay. Legendary things. So anyway, the right time is between 120 and 80,000. Then comes Deepam, the country. Then the Desam, the continent. Kulam, the caste. And Mata, the mother. The father is not mentioned. Yeah. So these are the five things that the Bodhisattva have to investigate to find the suitable time, country, continent, and then the caste and the mother. Now out of these five, two factors are about the location, the country and the continent. Where the suitable environment exits what matters even for a bodhisattva to be born. Yeah. Now, even in India, do you think Buddha was traveling all over the India? He traveled many places, but most of the times he spent where? In Magadha. He spent in Magadha. Modern Bihar. This area he travels most. Why? In this area, the extremism was not allowed to be practicing. Extreme, extremism was not allowed. Moderately. Everybody was allowed to practice their religion. So, not only the Buddha, those other teachers also spreading their teachings in this Magadha region. Buddha traveled to other places, but he major mainly accessed in this area. Why? It is suitable. It is not disturbing for his teaching to spread, to teach among people. So this suitability of the location is that important for the Buddhism. Yeah. So if a child grows up in suitable environment, it means that child naturally will have the right path. Because his environment is not supporting anything bad even to cultivate within himself. Yeah. If your house is located amidst the houses where all those criminal activities are happening, where, they are, where the people are using all those rude words and the rude kind of activities happening around you, even though you try to bring your child in the best or in the positive manner, it doesn't work because the location is wrong. Yeah. But we have to understand this is not something relevant to the present. This is because of the past. The past karma is responsible for directing that person to be born there. Yeah? The second one is, I mean in this stanza, the second one is that you have merits done in the past. That you have the accumulation of positive energy within your stream of consciousness. 
They are embedded in your own stream of consciousness. The positive energy we call the punya. According to the Buddha, punya or the positive energy, the meritorious effects of the past karma are the deciding factor of this sansara in the sense of whether you are living your life in a comfortable, luxurious, pleasant manner, whether you are achieving your goals, your aspirations in an easy manner or in a difficult manner. Now, even among the divine beings, there are two types of divine beings. All are divine beings, but there are two types. They are called Alpeshakya, Maheshakya. Yeah. Higher and lower status of divine beings. What decided this higher and lower status? Now, we became human beings with the complete five senses. The reason is our morality. The morality. It means that we were not living in a very harmful manner using the five senses in our samsaric journey, in our past life. That is why our senses are intact. Yeah. Though we have a, an intact, complete physical body, our gain and loss our status in the life, in the comfort sense, in the luxury sense, are always different. Even in the same family, the siblings will not gain the same lifestyle, same kind of comforts and luxury, because of the generosity they practiced, because of the practice of dana, they did in their past lives. So the dana or the generosity that somebody practice make the changes among the human beings, among even the siblings, in the form of getting things or losing things. Yeah. So the merit or the this this accumulation of positive energy within us leads us to a comfortable, happy life. But the problem is not that we don't have merits within us. The problem is our comparison with the world. We always tend to compare with the world and judge about ourselves. You have a roof over your head. A beautiful dress on your body. Three meals you don't miss easily. You have the five senses intact. You can see, you can hear, you can smell, you can walk, and you can talk. Do you know, these people you have taken happily for granted, yeah. can be the dreams for some millions of people in the world, millions of blind people, people who are deaf, People who cannot walk, they must be dreaming about walking one day, talking one day, listening to music one day, or seeing this world one day. Things we have taken for granted can be dreams for some other people. 
if you compare yourself with them, then you will see how fortunate I am, how lucky I am. But we always compare with some people who have a little bit more than us. Remember, there will be always somebody who have a little bit more than you. Who has everything? Who can have everything? Doesn't matter whether you become the richest man in the world, still you will be unfulfilled. You will find you are not so strong. There will be somebody stronger than you. There will be more somebody handsome than you, beautiful than you, taller than you. Yeah. Nobody is ever fulfilled. Hence, nobody is ever happy. Buddha compared our accumulations of merits to a shadow. There is a meaning for this comparison. Shadow is always neglected. We never look back and check whether shadow is following you or following me. Did you check? Those days when you were young, you were scared by the shadow sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Buddha compared Chayava Anapayane. Like the never leaving shadow, our heap of Meritorious accumulations are following us. They are within us. They are with us. And those meritorious energy always supporting us to overcome obstacles. To live this life happily. And also Buddha compared Merits to a light. He says, you have a light within you. But you make sure that you go back to the life. Go back to the light again. Jyoti Jyoti Parayana. You should be a person who is destined to go to the light. Not Jyoti Tamo Parayana. Not from the light to the darkness. But from the light to light. So we all carry a light, a big shadow behind us. Remember that light and the shadow is our positive energy, what we call the merit. That merit is always giving us the best blessing to us. What we gain. The way we live, the life we have today, thanks to those powerful positive energy within us. Buddha says, if somebody has that energy, positive energy within him, that is a great blessing for him. Yeah. That's why Buddha says, <clears throat> If somebody becomes a divine one, merits will support him. To the human beings, what is the support for the human being? That is merit. Meritorious support. Even somebody becomes a monk, merit is to support him. There are monks like Sivali, Venerable Arahant Sivali in Buddhism. He went never in hunger in his life, even if, if, if he is in a desert. Somebody will come and offer something to him. Never go hunger. His power of dana was such and among those monks, there were some monks like Losaka, Venerable Arahant Losaka, who were in hunger all his life. All his life, his stomach was never filled. 
He was always in hunger. When he was begging food, people ignored him. People did not give him food. He was always in hunger. He was to die with hunger. Then out of compassion, venerable Sariputra. He tried to fill his stomach even on the last day of his life, at least to have a sufficient food in his body, in his stomach. Venerable Sariputra did his best effort. Even then he couldn't do that then ultimately he had to feed this monk who is dying on his last day. Only then this monk could have a full stomach. There is, a, if, is there anybody to blame for this? Nobody to blame but to his own karma. What did he do? He intentionally kept an arahant in hunger throwing away the food which was meant, which was offered to this Arahant in, his, in one of his past lives. Out of jealousy, he threw away that food which was offered to Arahant. And because of that, even though he did the parami to become an enlightened monk, but still that karma came back to suffer, to give the suffering of hunger even in his last life. Karmic energy. So for the <coughs> venerable Sivali, his past karma, even after his enlightenment, a soothing, comfortable, blissful, happy life. Without much troubles, he gained the arms, gained the requirements, necessary requisites. But for this poor monk, even he became a monk, his requisites were never fulfilled. Even the most necessary food was not given to him properly. To have that meritorious power from our past life is a blessing. Now, if you happen to understand, if you happen to see why am I getting like this and somebody else getting like that, no need to, this, no need to be disturbed or troubled by it. This is what I accumulated. This is my collection. It is coming back to me. It is his collection. It is coming back to him. Yeah. Then all these jealousies or anger or hatred or blaming, complaining because of this person I don't get, because of that person I don't get it. Remember, if we are worthy of getting something, it means that we have given it in our past life. It is always bound to come to us. Nobody can stop it. Nobody can stop it. Sometimes the, 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 the we call Mara, the devil, if you translate into English, Mara, who was always against the Buddha, he tried to stop Buddha getting some things. He tried to stop. He tries to stop Buddha's arms, Buddha's dana sometimes. But he was never successful. Because Buddha had the better or stronger power of positive energy, which is called meritorious power, more than anybody else. Nobody could stop the Buddha's receivings of the Dhamma. Yeah. So the blessing of past meritorious deeds 
is a very important thing. That's why Buddha includes in this second verse as the fifth blessing that is Pubecha Katapunyata having the accumulation of past meritorious deeds. Okay? I think that is enough for today. Let's dedicate these merits to our departed ones and the devas. Akasatta chabumatta deva nagara mahidika punyantam anumoditva chiranga kantuloka sasanam Akasatta chabumatta deva nagara mahidika Punyantam anumoditva chiranrakkam tuloka sasana Akasatta chabumatta devana gamahidika Punyantam anumoditva chiranrakkam tuloka sasana Itam me nyati nam hotu Sukita hum tu nyateyo Idam me nyati nam kotu Sukita hum tu Idam me nyati nam kotu Sukita hum tu nyateyo Blessings for you Dukkaroga bayare ra soka sabbe upadrava Nekantaraya pirina santo chatejasa Jaya siddhi danam rabam sati bhagyan sukam badam Siriya yucha vanno cha bhogam uddhi cha yasa Satavasa cha yucha jiva siddhi bhavan tute Aira rogya sampatti Sagga sampatti nevacha Ato nibbana sampatti Minate samijatu